any questions. All I really want is for you to download the app. So you can basically ignore me for the next 10 minutes if you want, but the real goal is for you to just download Milk Crate. Um, so that's why I put this up here. But I will tell you a little bit about my background, how I came up with Milk Crate, where we're going, and, um, and then any questions you have about my entrepreneurial venture or my educational experience leading up to it or anything like that, please just ask. Um, so yeah. All right, so my parents are both actually entrepreneurs, so I grew up in a family of chaos and invention and was determined to never, ever, ever work for myself from that experience. And I said many times, I am never gonna be an entrepreneur. I started my first company when I was 17. <laughs> um, it was a fashion company where I made vintage purses, or I remade them um, using other vintage materials and kind of gave them new life. And I actually sold those designs to Anthropology and Joan Shep. I'm guessing you at least know what Anthropology is. Joan Shep's a high-end boutique in Philadelphia. Um, an entrepreneurial lesson I learned at a young age is if you don't have a contract that explicitly ex uh, details royalties, you are going to get ripped off. So <laughs> watch out for that. I learned that the hard way um, and didn't really do anything entrepreneurial for 12 years or t 10 years um, when I started Milk Crate, so, um, which was during my master's thesis at Philly U, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, leading up to that, I also worked at a local publication called Grid Magazine. Has anyone heard of Grid? It's, it's in Philadelphia only right now, um, and it specifically talks about sustainability. So it's kind of the hub and kind of beacon for the world that I started getting really passionate about and the cause that I really wanted to be working in. Um, so kind of came from an entrepreneurial background, started getting really into sustainability and specifically this magazine. Um, and then wound up going to Philly U. And uh, before I enrolled in Philly U, I was living in West Philly and I was thinking about sustainability and asking myself, how can I live more sustainably? What can I do to lessen my footprint, my impact, and how can I support my local economy and have my money where I shop, where I eat, uh, how I get around, have all of those things kind of reflect my values so that I wasn't kind of part of the problem. But there's no easy way to do that, right? Like, it's hard, and most of the time we're just kind of like, eh, whatever, because it's hard, or expensive, or we don't understand what the right choice is. And I got frustrated by this. I kept thinking, why hasn't someone already made it easy to make the right choices? Um, Grid, in some ways, was helping educate people and motivate them, but there was no easy tool to kind of take the inspiration of wanting to live more sustainably and then act on it. So. When I read about, when I was reading in Grid about the Sustainable Design Master's program, I thought, okay, maybe this is a, a career path where I can kind of learn how to do this and become more involved in this. So I, I, I did a fairly exhaustive search of Sustainable Design Master's programs um, around the country, and my criteria for grad school was three things. It had to be about sustainability. It had to incorporate design because I hadn't really done anything design-like since my first startup um, other than art classes in undergrad. And uh, it had to be free. That was a really important one. I did not want to go into debt. Um, I was terrified of it. And so I realized that Philly U, and preferably in the Philly area. So Philly U was the one thing that hit all three or four of those criteria. If you get in the assistantship program, you work for someone that they assign to you, you get a free master's. So I, was, I worked my butt off to ace the GRE. I got selected as one of the two uh, assistantships for my department and I got to actually work for the head of the department, Rob Fleming, who's on the cover here of GRID. So it all, everything kind of came full circle. I learned about the program in GRID, I actually got to work for this guy, and then I wound up working at GRID during the first year of my program. Um, but what I learned in my program, which is that most of the students are architects or engineers. So I don't know, you guys are entrepreneurs, if you're in an entrepreneurship program or maybe you're in other departments, your interests might not necessarily align exactly with the backgrounds and interests of the colleagues in your program. And that was very much the case for me. So we would do these design pinups or crits, um, which is really common in 
design school and something I didn't know about because I'd never gone to design school until grad school. So we'd kind of line up in our groups and it would be like, all right, hi, I'm Katie, I'm an architectural engineer. Hi, I'm Marina, I'm, a, I'm an interior designer. And then it would be my turn and I'd be like, hi, I'm Morgan, I'm a feminist anthropologist. <laughs> And you know, all the professors in the room would be like, what is this girl doing here? And I'd be like, what am I doing here? So I had to really think hard. You know, I got into grad school for free. Great. I'm not going to go into debt for a degree I can't use, but I'd really like to use this degree. Um, what am I going to do with it? And so that's when inventing my own job really started to click. And then it was, what am I going to do? Um, so that, that was also kind of in the back of my mind as Milk Crate was not yet a formalized idea, but definitely something that there was that impetus of, I've got to do something after this and no one's going to hire me to design a building because it might fall down. So I've got to figure out something else. Um, so the other thing that was going on in the kind of stew of my brain before Milk Crate formalized was that I was learning more and more about sustainability in the city and what the city specifically was doing around it, and Mayor Nutter in particular. Um, this is Mayor Nutter on the new bike share program that we're launching in Philly this spring. And I, I've since learned that about 8% of Philly's budget has been dedicated to sustainability programming, or almost $700 million over the next four years. So the city is investing a lot of resources in sustainable programming in the water department, the streets department, uh, like all kinds of different civic departments are spending money. Um, and they're actually advertising in grid and they're advertising on buses and they're doing all this spending and promoting, but there's no central place where if you care about sustainability and you want to tap into this and you want to understand every way that you can be more sustainable and access that information, it just doesn't exist. There is no one sustainability website for Philadelphia, let alone every city around the country. So that was also kind of getting me thinking. So when I was seeing all these different paths of transportation, food, and energy, I kept thinking there's got to be a way to bring them all together to help people move across this sustainability spectrum. So for my master's thesis, I analyzed every sustainable lifestyle app out there that is in some way trying to help people live more sustainably, whether it's about food, energy, uh, which is jewel bugs, or Recycle Bank, which is actually a pretty successful program. Has anyone here heard of Recycle Bank? I got one hand. Okay, so Recycle Bank, is, they were a startup that started in Philadelphia um, about eight years ago, I think. Um, something like that. They've since raised $80 million in venture capital money. They're in 300 communities and they have 400, 4 million users. And it's a recycling rewards program. And I was very inspired by this story of the, the success that they had in engaging municipal contracts, engaging um, residents to participate in their program. But it was just about recycling. And that was really frustrating to me. I'm like, there, there, we have 24 lifestyle categories in Milk Crate now. Waste is one of them, but there, so is food, energy, transportation, education, and it goes on. So why isn't there a recycle bank for everything? So that was kind of, when I was doing this matrix and this research, it kind of helped me see what people were doing right, but also where the gaps were. And that's kind of what informed the design um, and kind of business model of Milk Crate. And obviously it gets all the green stars because it's so much better than everything else. Um, so this is just kind of like, you know, a slide to talk about my in-class uh, education and my outside of the classroom education. So at Philly U, I was doing a master's in sustainable design, which was very much focused on the built environment and architecture. Um, I don't have a background in either of those things. I did a lot of reading about it before I applied to grad school, so I felt like it was the right choice for me. Um, and then we had the Blackstone Launchpad, which just opened pretty much as I was graduating. The last semester I was there was when they were starting to really pull it together. And that is kind of the entrepreneurship center for Phil U. It's a, an office with two people who work in it um, and a lot of good intentions and experience, but not uh, there, there hadn't been a, a trajectory of um, success or kind of helping people with their startup. So I was kind of their guinea pig, um, but it was a really great kind of first step in that incubation process for me. So when it came time to graduate, or even before then, I started going to co-working spaces. Do you all know what co-working spaces are? Yeah, that's like a thing now that everyone knows about. 
Um, a couple years ago, it wasn't quite as uh, well known, especially to me. So I went to places like Impact Hub and Ben's Desk to meet other entrepreneurs and to tell them about my idea and to try and find teammates. I didn't even know they were called that, but I was just like, I need help and I can't code. I took one advanced web development class as part of my branching out of my department uh, credits to figure out how to build Milk Crate and that was enough uh, code experience to know that there was no way I was gonna be the person to, to build Milk Crate and that I had to find the technical co-founder. So going to these co-working spaces was part of my strategy to get the word out there and to be like, I need help. This is my idea. If anyone wants to help me, <laughs> please talk to me. So did a lot of that. Um, and going to code for Philly events and things like that. So kind of took, you know, the in-class experience and then kind of had to go out into the real world and continue that learning and talking and uh, networking. And eventually I was able to build a team. <laughs> it wasn't as easy as clicking a button and suddenly there were seven of us, but um, over about, I guess, seven months. So Nicole was the first person to join me and that was about a year ago. And then the last person to join us, uh, Nigel and Kyle were kind of tied they probably both came on about four or five months ago. So about eight months to build the team. Um, and yeah, now I have a CFO, a CTO, a media manager, um, someone who handles our data and kind of internal values and how it relates to the data in our database. And I'm happy to answer questions about that later. Um, and so yeah, and obviously Kyle who's doing sales, which is a very important part of a business. So this is the next version of Milk Crate. Um, since you've all downloaded the app now, you will see that they're probably, I didn't check before I walked in, but I'm guessing there's pretty much nothing in the immediate area in our database. Is that right? Yeah, there's nothing, right? So we have about 2,000 listings in our database, but it's only in the Philly area right now. We are in the process of building, uh, we have probably will be going live with over 1,000 listings in Colorado by the end of next month. Um, also Asheville, North Carolina. And in a few months, DC, we have Georgetown University grad students building a database for us down there. Um, so we, we are very much about partnering with local organizations that have data and then we import their data into our database. So right now we don't have anything in Delaware, but I'm guessing you guys go to Philly once in a while. So when you go to Philly, you can use Milk Crate. Um, so like I said, I started this as my master's thesis, my, first, uh, my second year of grad school. Uh, we launched the first version of the app and our website and our crowdfunding campaign on my birthday, August 24th of last year. People are always posting on your wall, so I was just like, thank you so much for the birthday wishes. Go buy yourself a present in my crowdfunding campaign. Um, so we raised 103% of our goal, uh, $20,000 uh, and change. And the way we did that was really through building partnerships. You basically open up the app, it'll show you what's nearby, or you can do a search by category, name, or location. But the other new feature in the app are gonna, is going to be these form fill campaigns. And this is where our work with the city comes in. So every civic department and organization, which are a lot of them are over here that we've been talking with, we're talking with them about sponsoring these form fill campaigns. It's basically, basically a lead generation uh, tool for them so that the water department, for instance, wants people to sign up for a free rain barrel because we have a stormwater management issue in Philly. So anytime a Milk Crate user who's a sustainably minded person like myself or hopefully many of you, um, they will be searching for whatever and then they'll see this and they'll say, oh yeah, that looks interesting. And then they click yes, please, because we will have Twitter and Facebook integration in the app. Basically just clicking yes means your information will get sent to the water department and they'll follow up with you. So this is something the city really wants because there's been no way for them to directly communicate with residents <coughs> around participating in more sustainable lifestyle choices. So those lifestyle choice opportunities are going to be integrated into our directory. So it's not just a passive information tool uh, like a Yellow Pages or a Yelp, it's also a kind of direct action item thing that you can do inside of the app. So that's going to be in the next version as well. So. Um, obviously going to end on this slide because download Milk Crate. Um, so that's pretty much the, the quick version of the story. I'd love to take any questions about any part of that. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks for, uh, for sharing all this with us. It's really yeah. awesome. Um, how does a business qualify as a sustainable business to get on your app? Excellent question. So I, I briefly mentioned Nicole, who's our data and values director. So. Her job is to oversee all the partnerships we've built with nonprofits. So we have about a dozen nonprofits that have agreed to give us their data. And that was a very long process. And it's one of the things that kind of gives us some protection in terms of uh, copycats. 
that uh, I had to get that first executive director to say, yes, I trust you and your mission to give you our list of businesses that we vetted. And, and then once they said yes, it became a lot easier to get the second, third, and fourth. So there are organizations like the Sustainable Business Network, Fair Food, B Corp, the Humane League, Fair Trade, that have their own kind of niche perspective on what sustainability means, and then they have their criteria. So what we do, and I didn't really outline this well, and I should include this slide in here. Um, when you look at a business in Milk Crate, you click, so this is a free listing. So you click on one of the like listings in list view, and then this opens up, and this is a free page. We also have premium that businesses can pay us for. But the badges that they've earned, which are basically from, these are, this is some of our partner organizations. So here's B Corp. This is, uh, they have over 100 businesses in Philly that are B Corp certified. So their data is in our database. And then we put that right there on the profile, and then you can click on it and learn what that means. So what is a B Corp? So instead of inventing our own metric or definition of sustainability, which if anyone here has studied sustainability knows that's pretty difficult to do. It's a pretty amorphous and complicated concept. We basically said, you know what? There are all these organizations that have expertise in their specific realm. We're going to partner with them, pull their definition of sustainability into Milk Crate. And then eventually, we're going to allow users to rank the values and badges that are most important to them, which will affect the, the way that businesses show up. So if you're a vegan, you're going to drag the Humane League badge to the top, because that really matters to you. And you want to support vegan-oriented businesses with vegan options. If you are really passionate about cooperatives, then that would be a badge that you would drag to the top, so the PACA badge. So that's kind of how the values and criteria and data works. Yeah. Um, so that is directly pitching to us. How do you advertise? And, uh, which is <laughs> this is it. <laughs> this is my whole growth strategy right here. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So we're still developing that, but some of the things that we're already doing, um, well, we're going to be launching a pretty common like digital advertising campaign um, using a local consultant um, that we're, we pay him, and then he pays uh, Facebook and other platforms to post ads. So that's kind of the boring traditional route. Um, we actually just had a great, I just started working on something yesterday. So does anyone know how Airbnb got its start? On cre by like Gorilla, yeah. Yeah, well there was like a conference in San Francisco and they were, and there were like a, people needed housing so they rented out their. their yeah, and how'd they do their early advertising and outreach? It was a Craigslist. It was, yeah, with yeah. Craigslist. So something I started doing yesterday was posting reviews on Yelp as Milk Crate and saying, hey, this is a local sustainable business. It's in Milk Crate. Check out Milk Crate. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's going to work, but I thought it was a great idea. So I'm going to start doing it. I can't keep doing that. Actually, we're looking for an intern. If anyone's interested in doing more of that, I need help with that. Um, but what we're also doing, we have a David who's out in Colorado right now. He's in charge of all of our interns. And um, we have students on pretty much every college campus in the Philadelphia area who have built this massive database of all the uh, listservs and groups that are related to what we're doing and we're going to be blasting those newsletters and they're going to be promoting us to the college campuses so that's going to be kind of an early adopter um, thing for us but also all of our partner organizations they have huge networks of supporters um, and both businesses and users that they promote us to so that's been a, that's another kind of track for us to do do promotion yeah um, so did you plan on having uh, so many partners when you first started out? Um, did, you, did you know exactly how it was going to break down or did it just kind of happen when... Partners like this or teammates? No, like your teammates. Oh, yeah, no, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, <laughs> I, I knew I needed a technical co-founder, so that was like all I could think about was like I could keep pitching as much as I like, but if no one's actually coding anything, it's never going to be real. So that was all I could think about. But before I found Jason, I found Nicole. She kind of found me, and she was like, she just started sitting me down and like talking me through and asking me questions. And um, she was actually studying entrepreneurship at Drexel. And I was like, can you help me more and like build a spreadsheet? <laughs> and so we just started working together. And I was like, will you be my partner? And she was like, whoa. Like, uh, I already have this other company, I'm in school, blah, 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 but I'll help you. And it was really great to work with someone who understood what it meant to be a co-founder and that she wasn't ready for that. 
and that she was already too committed to other things. And she was just like, I'm going to help you, but like, I'm not ready to call myself a co-founder. Let's see how this goes. And like, that was one of the best things she ever did for me because I didn't understand the value of that. And she'd already started a company with another co-founder. And so she understood that dynamic a little bit better. So um, as things progressed and more people started reaching out to me, um, Basic, I got really lucky. The right people reached out to me. I've, I, I have had to fire one person, but otherwise it's been really great. And people, the right people reach out. They have amazing skills. And I say, you know, what do you want to do? What, what, why do you want to do this? We do a trial period. And then if it goes really well after a couple months, then, you know, we sign a contract. And it's not like I'm paying them, but I'm giving them a piece of the company. So um, that's kind of been the process. And we've just managed to find the right people. And there has... I have had to do a lot of kind of soul searching of, you know, I need to delegate. Who, what kind of person do I need to delegate this chunk of what I'm not able to handle anymore? Who, what's the right person for that job? And kind of having to do that self inventory of understanding what do I need right now in a teammate, um, what's missing, and then kind of keeping my eyes open when when people do reach out, seeing are, is this the person that matches that need? So that's kind of been the process. Yeah. I'm faculty from a social science background, mm -hmm. and I work in public relations too. And I'm curious how you emerged from the social science chrysalis <laughs> and found the guts to do this, and what you would do or what you would say to other, you know, young pre-professionals, yeah. students, to tell them, you know, stop going to coffee houses and reading your poetry and do something else. Read poetry, but on the weekends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's pretty funny. I was pulling in and I saw a sign for Planned Parenthood. Um, I worked there. It was my first job out of college. Not this one, but um, that was pretty much what kicked me in the pants enough to want to do something else because working in nonprofits is really hard. It's really tough, um, especially when you have this hunch that you'd be really good at something else. And, uh, you know, as much as I was passionate about the cause, so my undergrad, I was a women's studies major and anthropology minor, and all through undergrad I, I raised money for domestic violence shelters, did sexual assault awareness and um, sexual health education on campus, and, like, that was all I cared about. That was what I was going to do with the rest of my life, and Planned Parenthood was where I was going to do it. Um, I worked there long enough to have my first job, like, r eliminated, my second job, my hours cut, and then my health center shut down. And all the while watching, you know, leaders either failing us or losing, you know, their ability to lead and like all kinds of problems. Not to say that like nonprofits can do amazing work and Planned Parenthood does amazing work, but my experience there was so frustrating as a professional um, who wanted to make a difference that I finally was like, I'm going to have to make a difference in some other way. And I want to do it in a way that I find rewarding intellectually and financially. And neither of those things were happening there. So it was just that frustration and that fear in my mid-20s of, oh my god, I might live the rest of my life and never feel fulfilled. I better try something now so that if, if I wind up failing, at least I know I tried. So that was kind of the moment of just kind of sitting on my bed one cold winter morning thinking like, I might be miserable for the rest of my life. I might never find professional fulfillment. What's the one thing I can try and do that would change that? And that's kind of what you know led me to apply to the master's program I applied to and going down that path. And then it was just a matter of you know taking opportunities as they came up and continuing to ask that same question of, you know, is this the path of comfort but misery, or is this the path of like fear but potentially really feeling satisfied and fulfilled? So always going with the second one. Yeah. I know you said that um, the people on your team, you offered them equity. Mm -hmm. How did you go from the point where you were wandering around looking for a co-founder to the point where people were looking for you? And yeah. Well, like I said, I was wandering around looking for what turned out to be Jason um, when Nicole approached me. So she wasn't a technical co-founder, but I realized I still needed, I didn't know how to build a business model or a spreadsheet. She was taking business classes, so I was like, help me. So, you know, it was just kind of realizing that there were other things I needed besides a technical co-founder to make the company successful. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just picturing, like, how did they hear about you? Like, yeah, live? I just made a lot of noise, um, you know, getting press. It was just like telling people, I'm doing this thing, it's really cool, this is why it's special. 
and then if it resonated with someone they they found me so it was just kind of using the media as my like job advertising board without actually explicitly saying it um, and that's just yeah people literally just once they heard about what I was doing they would reach out so that's the best I mean that's the only thing I did I never now we put ads out once in a while for like interns because we have like specific tasks that we need done um, but for teammates I've never advertised for it was really just getting the word out there about milk crate knowing what I needed and when the right people reached out like finding that fit and luckily I haven't had too many people reach out that weren't a good fit yeah Tell us a little bit about what your, uh, your revenue model is now and what you think it might be in five years from now. Yes, good question. Um, so the revenue stream right now is selling the, the form fill campaigns um, for, oh, where'd they go? The sign up forms for the, yeah, these things. Um, where? Here, I'll just make this big, but I'll be able to move around. So this is one revenue stream for the next version that we're launching. And then the other one are these premium accounts. So like Zipcar is a new customer of ours in Philly. Um, they pay X amount of dollars a year. They get a premium, an annual subscription for their, their premium account. So those are the two things that, we're gonna, that we've started bringing money in for um, for this next version. Going forward, there are two revenue streams that I'm really excited about that we haven't completely modeled but are going to be big <laughs> how big I'm not sure yet but um, the one I, I mentioned recycle bank we're actually meeting with them next week um, the corporate people from New York are coming down to talk with us about how we can improve their rewards um, engagement rates so I think it says oh it doesn't say so they're only getting about 13 percent engagement with their rewards so when you recycle every week and you're a part of the recycle bank program in your community um, you get points and when you accrue enough points you can redeem them for a Bed Bath & Beyond gift card or you can get 10% off a movie ticket or whatever. Um, they've built partnerships, some with sustainable businesses, some with not. Um, and they're only getting about 13% engagement around redeeming those points. There's a lot of friction between when someone earns a point to actually redeeming it. There are all these moments that a user has to think about and make deliberate choices to say, oh, I have this many points, where can I redeem it? Then I have to go there, then I have to remember I have it and I have to take it out on my phone and there's this whole thing. So what Milk Crate's gonna do differently is when someone uh, is nearby a Milk Crate business, we're gonna send a push notification. Hey, you're, there's a Milk Crate business right there that you've been meaning to check out, maybe you've saved them on your favorites list. When you walk into a Milk Crate business, your phone's gonna know it and it's gonna say, hey, your recycle bank points, let's use them. Um, and we're also going to start bringing in milk crate points that aren't just about recycle banks. So if you sign a, if you sign up for one of our form fill campaigns, or you start doing check-ins and other kind of fun in-app things, you're going to get points for that, and those points are going to turn into rewards. So there's going to be some sort of uh, monetization with those rewards and with recycle bank. We just we're still working that out. Um, the other revenue stream that I'm excited about. So this was, I mentioned that Nicole had already started a company um, and that she was like, whoa, when I tried to make her my co-founder. So that's her co-founder, Maria. And 4C Consulting, uh, they're about a year and a half older than Milk Crate. And they help companies become B Corp certified. Does anyone know what B Corp certification is? Yeah? What is yeah, it? I, I guess you have to qualify in certain ways to become a B Corp. And that is basically like a benefit corporation, right? And um, it just says that you're sustainable and you're doing good work and you treat your employees well and there's a whole bunch of criteria that separates you from just a normal corporation. Perfect. So they, it's a pretty lengthy process. Uh, we've gone through it. We're in the, we're pending B Corp status. Um, we basically just need to cut them a check. And uh, so it's, it's a lengthy and kind of expensive process. Um, so 4C is a consulting company that helps you attain that certification. And they've worked with lots of local companies and some um, national companies to help them achieve that certification. Milk Crate's actually going to be absorbing 4C. I've been referring to it as our sister company, but we're going to officially merge with them um, probably this summer. And the goal is that as we help individuals move across the sustainability spectrum and improve different parts of their lives, we're actually going to also do that with companies. So that Milk Crate won't just be a B2C platform, but will become B2B. And there will be um, a kind of online uh, course 
process that 4C will be in charge of. So that a business comes in, say a business applies to Mill Crate through our website. Because there's two ways to get into Mill Crate. I talked about the partnership model, but we also have a website where you can just submit your business. And if you, uh, we use the B Corp mini assessment to assess you if you're not part of one of our member organizations. So if you don't meet our criteria, then 4C comes in and says, hey business, thanks for applying. Here are the reasons why we didn't let you in. Here's some things you could do to get in and here's how we could help you achieve those goals. And then we become a consultant to that business to help them become more sustainable and help them get those certifications. So there's, there's, that's the other kind of down the line. Um, and the reason I, I, I for so long didn't even want to think about it because I was so overwhelmed by building Milk Crate, but I kept, you have to listen to what people say to you. And I kept getting asked, what about businesses? And I would sit down with business owners trying to pitch them to become customers. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Whatever, we'll do that. But really, how do I get access to your businesses? I have a sustainable product or service that I really want to sell to businesses that want to be more sustainable. And I'm like, why does this keep happening? This is so frustrating. I don't want you to pay me for that. I want you to pay me for this other thing. But when you're an entrepreneur and business owners are telling you, I want to pay you to do something, you need to figure out how to take their money. So that's when the whole, and, and when you start meeting with investors and they're like, oh, B2C, really? And B2B is the hot thing. Those two things start to come together and you have to really start to listen and realize that it in fact completely falls in line with your mission and the way that, you know, it, it all clicks and it fits. It was just scary to have to think about kind of almost two parallel businesses. So we're not ready to pursue this, but it's going to be a part of the company probably in about a year. Um, so when you were first starting up and it was just you, um, did you have any, like, was anybody else helping you along the way, like your the mentor that you were working with who was on the cover of that magazine, or was anybody helping you? Um, I mean, the school was helping me very much in that I said to myself, I said to them, I'm not an architect, no architecture firm is going to hire me to be a designer. I was in fact working at an architecture firm at the time doing marketing and business development and was so miserable because I had just spent... You know, I had gotten into this master's program to become a designer, and the only job I could find was doing business development at an architecture firm, which was just insult to injury. And they wouldn't. And then I was in the firm, and I'm like, "Let me design, let me design." They wouldn't let me. So I was saying to my department head and the other professors, "I need to start taking classes in other departments because this just isn't going to work. It's not, you know, it's not you, it's me." Um, and so I started taking classes in other departments, and that really helped me because then I could get advice from the head of interactive media. You know, Harner became a real advisor of mine, um, who otherwise I never would have gotten to work with because he wasn't in my department. But the man, you know, he owns a, a web firm. He is the head of the academic department in charge of building apps and websites. Like, he was the perfect person to mentor me. Um, so it was just a matter of saying, like, knowing what I needed and then getting into the right class and then that professor becoming my mentor. So Neil was a really kind of my first mentor in this world um, because my professors in my department, you know, they understood sustainability, but they couldn't help me with this. They didn't understand business models. They didn't understand tech. Um, so yeah, it was just having to get into the right department was the real hurdle. So who's, um, so you said that you were in a bunch of different groups now. Yeah. Uh, how did they, how did you guys go about that? You just just spend a bunch of time looking them up and applying to them? Like our incubators? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my first like Philly I call Philly you my first incubator because um, of you know doing those other departments and my work with Neil. But then I applied for um, an incubator called Tribe Twelve, which I just someone on Facebook posted um, and I was like, Oh, what's that? And it's a, an incubator for Jewish art, young entrepreneurs in Philly. And it's, you know, not an incredibly, incredibly well-established or experienced program, but I was like, it's better than nothing and it's free and they're not going to take equity. It'll give me some kind of structure and hopefully some resources and guidance I don't already have. So that, and it was great and it gave me exactly that. It's not Dream It, it's not Y Combinator, but it was better than nothing. And I really appreciate um, what they did for me. And um, I'm now a mentor in that program to someone. Um, I, I graduated last year and now I'm mentoring someone this year. So that was my first real incubator. And then the second one I did was called CoPhilly. And they're an incubator for crowdfunding campaigns, which I know a lot of you are probably thinking, easy money. It's not, it's not easy money. Um, the potato salad thing was a fluke. <laughs> it doesn't happen. That was so maddening because we were planning our campaign when that happened. And we were just like, 
oh god we're trying to save the planet and build a business and you want to make potato salad great um if you don't know what i'm talking about just google potato salad and crowdfunding um so what was i doing okay co-philly so co-philly they were themselves a startup which is always tricky business when you are a startup and a, another startup is saying, oh, we can help you, we're experienced. And you're like, really? <laughs> um, again, it was kind of like, you're not the best, you're not the worst. I've managed to get it for free. That's a really important thing to remember, get it for free. Um, and, and it provided an infrastructure and some guidance that we wouldn't have had otherwise and it helped us accomplish our goals. Um, so that was the second one. And then, um, and now Project Liberty. Um, and that actually, again, they don't take equity, they don't cost anything, but they're also kind of bare bones. You get office space. You get office space at 8th and Market inside of the Inquirer, and it's a pipeline to Ben Franklin Technology Partners, but it's very hands-off. They basically expect you to be grown-ups and know how to run your company. There's a guy there that if you have questions, he's experienced and you can ask him stuff, but he's not there very often, and you just kind of left to run your company. But you have free rent and, uh, pretty much a pipeline into due diligence with Ben Franklin. So those are the three programs we've done. And it's very much, you know, my, my at starting with where I went to grad school, it was like, get it for free. You know, don't go into debt, don't own it, owe anyone anything, and try and control as much as possible while not being a control freak. Um, so the three programs we've done, you know, we did apply for Dream It. We got an interview. Um, I actually was talking with one of the founders last night who was like, you've got to get into Dream It. I'm like, they rejected us after our interview, but thanks. <laughs> Understanding people's strengths, especially coming from a program like mine where there was a, while I was definitely the we, one of the weirdest in the group, there was a pretty good diversity in terms of professional backgrounds. Um, and so understanding how to draw on people's different strengths when you're in a designing process. So just yesterday, we spent over an hour and a half with this amazing gamification consultant who, again, came in for free to help us. And, um, you know, I've got Nicole, who is the taskmaster and literally calls herself the hammer, who at the beginning of the meeting was like, all right, so just to go over the expectations of the meeting, we're here to do, to go through the list of features and vote yes or no. And I was like, yes, that, that is what we're going to do. But first we have Eric here, who's going to, I think, give us a little background on how to make good choices when you're talking about gamification features. So like, she's there to keep us on track and like that's a really important part of a group in a design process but she's not herself a game designer so we needed to defer to the expert and my job as the ceo was to kind of manage those egos and then we've got kyle who's in charge of growth and sales who's starting to really freak out about like the launch and getting sales started and he's wanting to think about that timeline so you know that's something you learn when you're working in a group in design schools like you know you've got your interior designer your architect your engineer they all have their different focuses and things they think are the most important thing and then in the one thing that's different in design schools there's no ceo you all just kind of have to battle it out i guess it's better in this sense in that it's my job as the designer to understand that they're gonna battle and i have to kind of help them like battle in the right way so that we all win um, so yeah, that, I, I was just thinking about that yesterday actually because of that meeting and I, as, as sad as I am that I don't get to really design with my hands with a pen every day, um, the process of design is fun to manage and that's something that I do get to do every day. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah.